Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today for Towards Net Zero, a panel discussion with mine operations leaders sponsored by CIM Magazine and Stantec. I am your host, Ryan Bergen, Editor-in-Chief of CIM Magazine, which is published by the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum. So to begin, just a little housekeeping. Uh, to ensure we ha you have optimal audio, make sure that if you are using your computer audio that the button for computer audio is selected on your control panel. Uh, if you dialed in on your phone, ensure the phone button is selected. Please note that the audience is muted for this session, but we do encourage your participation. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and also give them a quick proofread. Uh, it, it, does a, it ensures that they'll be asked if they are nicely uh, and clearly written. Uh, the questions will be held until the Q&A period after the discussion. Uh, we also want to let you know that a recording of today's webinar will be shared with everyone who registered. Uh, now let's get things underway. Uh, pressure continues to grow to act against climate change. More and more mining companies have been city, setting ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, this is in step with institutional investors who are trimming their exposure to companies without a clear strategy for cutting their emissions. Uh, the goal is net zero, to either emit, emit no greenhouse gases or offset them through carbon capture or other mitigation measures. How decades from now we reach that net zero objective is an open question, so it is great that we can bring this panel together today to discuss. The moderator for today is John Treen, um, Senior Vice President for Mining at Stantec, and joining him are Glenn Watson, Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs Specialist for North Atlantic Operations at Valley Canada, Angie Robson, Vice President, Corporate Affairs and Social Responsibility at Torex Gold, and Glenn Barr, Vice President, Engineering at Twin Metals. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. John? Thanks, Ryan. And thank you, panel, for being part of this, uh, what I think is going to be a great, great session. You know, one of the great things we have today is just a diverse panel. We bring people from major companies like Valet to mid-tier producers like Torex to development projects like Twin Metals. And so you get to have all the aspects of what to consider when you're looking at net zero. And I look forward to what each of the panelists are going to share. Speaking of share, I want to start with a safety share like we always do in the business. And, and I thought I'd apply it to sort of the net zero concepts that we have going on. And regardless of what the change you're looking to put in, change management is always important. And, and so I'll just use the example of battery electric equipment. Um, you know, so when we think about that and we're putting it in, we need to do change management of what that means for safety as well too. So now we've got charging stations we need to deal with. We've got large batteries. We need to re relocate, move in and out. We also have different fire potentials and, and fumes from the batteries. And so that all needs to be considered when you look at what the changes are from the safety impact. But on the other side, we also need to think about what the safety benefits are, not just environmentally, but what does it mean for less diesel fuel being transmitted underground, less diesel emissions going through the equipment? What does it look like for diesel as far as containment if there's spillages? So all this needs to be considered when we go through the change process of, of whatever energy transition or changes within any of our operations. So I just wanted to, to use that as the quick safety share. Um, maybe I'll get started. As Ryan said, I'm with Stantec uh, Consulting and very excited that Stantec was actually recognized as the uh, first leading sustainability company within North America and number five within the world by Corporate Knights on the Sustainability Index, which is, which is a very exciting for us. Um, we've made a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2022, which is next year, uh, and then to be net zero by 2030. And so these goals and ob objectives are very important. We have plans on how to do that. And as a consulting firm, it's different than a mining company. Um, but I know, you know, if I look at the panel here, all of the group have goals, objectives, and some even stated uh, objectives that they're looking to target. And so maybe let's actually start off with that question. And so Angie, I'll, I'll start with you and sort of say, let us know, Torex, 
you know, what's the company's commitment, what goals, and how are you looking to go towards the net zero? And, and maybe if you could just take a minute to talk a little bit about Torex for those on the call that may not be familiar. Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Thanks for the question. And thanks for inviting me to participate on the behalf of Torx Gold. It's great to be here. So just to provide a little context about our company, uh, we're a mid-tier gold producer. We're headquartered in Toronto. Our operating asset is in a place called Guerrero, Mexico, which is equidistant between Mexico City and Acapulco. And we're located in quite a remote area. There's just um, 11 very small communities around us. Um, we're a pretty new company. Our company was formed about a decade ago, and um, we started commercial production in 2016. And today we're quite a sizable operation. Um, in 2020, we were actually the second largest gold producer in the country with about 1,000 direct employees and another 1,700 contractors. And 99% of our workforce are Mexican nationals. So our operations are a combination of open pit and underground mining, and we have a fully integrated processing facility from which we produce final Doré bars. In terms of our company character, for us, mining responsibly and earning the trust of our stakeholders has always been central to our business philosophy from the very beginning. And we really pride ourselves on the strong relationships we built with local communities and local stakeholders. We're also really proud of the safety focused culture that we've built with our employees. And in fact, we recently achieved 10 million hours worked without a lost time injury, which we're really proud of. And we're also proud of our approach to mining in a way that really embraces innovation and respects the planet. And I'll get into a little bit more on that during the re remainder of the panel discussion. So with respect to climate change specifically, I would say Torex is quite early on in our journey. Um, we conducted an inventory of both our scope one and scope two emissions uh, since 2019, um, both of which have been independently verified. So we've got two years of data to act as our baseline against which to measure our future improvement. And we haven't yet declared any public commitments for targets, although we are committed to developing a strategy on climate change this year, aligned with the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, or the TCFD. And we're fully committed to taking tangible steps to ensure that Torex is doing our part to achieve the commitments made under the Paris Agreement with an eventual path to net zero. So in terms of the drivers of the risks behind the strategy, you know, certainly there's never been a bigger focus by our investors and I think all investors in making sure that companies have tangible plans in place to get uh, to net zero. And, and as I said earlier, we're also driven by our commitment to live by our values and to do the right thing uh, to leave a net positive legacy in our host communities and in society more broadly. And so beyond that, I will say that making sure we fully understand the drivers, the opportunities and the risks both at the executive team level and at the board level are exactly the phase we're at in terms of the development of our climate change strategy and our climate change commitments. So we're a company that's committed to delivering on what we say we will do. And so it's important to us that we're not just out there setting commitments or targets with that at least a high level plan to walk the talk to get us there. And so I thought I'd just quickly walk you through the steps that we're taking in terms of the development of our strategy this year. So first, we're conducting a standalone climate change materiality assessment. And by that, I mean we're creating a prioritized list of climate-related risks and opportunities based on potential financial impact and likelihood across multiple timeframes. Second, we're focusing on governance. So we want to make sure we've got the right level of management and board oversight of material climate-related risks and opportunities in terms of rules and accountabilities and management routines and so forth. And so just as an example, just a small change we made this year is that we formally added climate change oversight to our board safety and corporate social responsibility committee mandate. And we also formally added climate change to that committee's quarterly work plan, just to ensure we're consistently reporting against our project progress to the board of directors and they've got good oversight on what we're doing and what, where we're headed. With the appropriate governance in place, we'll then start to get into the heart of our strategy by developing a climate change position statement, which we plan to do this year, endorsed by ex our executive team and our board. And really that will guide our go forward plan. And this step will also involve the development of metrics and targets and a roadmap for conducting future detailed technical studies on our key areas of focus for GHG reductions based on a high level carbon footprint study. And finally, we're going to focus on disclosure. So just making sure we've got the appropriate climate related reporting and disclosure to our investors and our other stakeholders in alignment with the TCFD. And in fact, this fall, we plan to release our first 
uh, standalone climate report to act as a baseline to, for continuous improvement going forward. So John, all this to say, we're currently into heavy, heavy into strategy development and um, stay tuned for our public commitments and targets to come soon. No, thanks, Angie. And I think, you know, just going over the steps for your strategy to the sustainability journey are, are rarely helpful to the audience. And, you know, if it's any success like you've had on your safety journey, we look forward to what comes out of it. So, so thank you very much for sharing that. You know, maybe I'll turn it over now to Glenn Watson. And, and Glenn, you can talk about Valley. I know you've got lots on the go with Valley globally, and I think you'll focus on North Atlantic, but uh, would really appreciate some of, of your thoughts on what's going on with the goals and targets there. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for the introduction and uh, and for this opportunity. Uh, let me start straight away with Valley's commitments with respect to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and these are first and foremost, alignment with the Paris Agreement. Valley is committed to a 33% reduction in scope one and scope two absolute emissions by 2030. We're targeting a 15% reduction in scope three absolute emissions by 2035. And of course, we're uh, targeting uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And these efforts are aimed uh, at limiting and increase the global average temperature. People are familiar with this uh, goal to two degrees Celsius or less, and this is consistent with the Paris Accord. And this is part of what um, we are delivering on, on this is how we're, uh, we're delivering on what we're calling our new pact with society, which in addition to the greenhouse gas commitments I just mentioned, it includes commitments to renewable electricity, to forest protection, water usage reduction, and socio uh, socioeconomic contribution. It, it really essentially means becoming high performing in environment, social and governance, ESG, which this term is uh, for people on this call, may, many will be familiar with. But this is this is a tall order. These these commitments are significant for many reasons, but primarily because of the the geographical extent and the magnitude of our operations. Our our operations are also complex, right? and in some cases, we've been in operation for over 100 years. Valley ranks among the largest miners in the world. We have operations in about 30 countries. We serve markets and industries such as steel mills on all continents. We're leaders in the production of iron ore, iron ore pellets, and nickel. And we produce a suite of other metals, many considered to be the critical minerals necessary for the global shift to a sustainable future. So how are we doing this? Valet has created a, what we're calling a low carbon forum, and it's led by our CEO and executive directors. And this level of commitment requires all in support from the highest levels of the organization, or, or it doesn't happen. That really needs no further explanation. Valley's committed at least 2 billion US uh, to, buy, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as a company, we've already invested in renewables such as hydro, wind, and biodiesel. And here in Sudbury, Ontario, for example, we have our own hydro facility to supplement our power usage. And it's been in existence for decades. With the low carbon form that I just mentioned though, we started with a detailed mapping of our emissions. I mean, this is the first thing you have to do. You need to understand your operation from the perspective of how, where your greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And for our North Atlantic operations alone, which I represent, and to be clear, these are operations in Canada, the UK and Japan, we've identified over 250 greenhouse gas reduction opportunity projects. I would say one of the most important features of our approach there to identifying these opportunities was to have the operators of our mines and plants directly involved in the process. These are the people that operate the plants, they understand them and see the inefficiencies day in, day out. They're the best, they're, they're best positioned to help develop these projects. And we're now transitioning to implementing some of these projects, which I'll discuss later in our conversation. But Back to the question, and there was a piece on risks and drivers. I mean, the drivers may be a bit selfishly finding efficiencies through energy and process optimization and potential cost savings, right? We do well by becoming more efficient as a company. That's just good business, and it improves our bottom line. Of course, low carbon projects improve and will improve our market positioning and access. And 
as Angie mentioned earlier, maintaining investor confidence. The, the business climate is changing rapidly. And we understand that the way to develop our products is in the way we develop them are, is increasingly under, uh, under scrutiny. People want to see green products. But there are risks, and there are obviously technological risks, and some of the solutions we're developing still require extensive R&D. Economic feasibility, of course, right? Well, especially when we talk about electrification and hydrogen or SMRs, there's still a way to go to develop lower CapEx, OpEx solutions. And the acceptability of certain technologies, right? Like small modular reactors, for instance. There's also a potential risk of inequality across markets or a lack of consistent border tariffs, for example, right? Which can disincentivize the chase, uh, chasing a, a, a net zero strategy. Or maybe even risks that other companies might default to chasing cheap or unreliable offset credits and avoid the investment required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a bit of a start on that. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity and, and um, I'll have more to say in the coming questions. Thanks. No, thanks, Glenn. I mean, you, you covered quite a bit in detail and, and like where Valet is going, what you've done so far as an organization. You know, one thing I just, I'll do a quick sidetrack here. You mentioned sort of the new pact with society. And I, I just want to put a challenge out actually to the listeners on this call. I think, now, you know, we do a very good job sharing within the industry some of the best practices. We are a much more um, sharing organization and industry than we were before because it's not as much pri proprietary. It's about how we can be successful as an overall group. Uh, so the challenge I put out in, in touching on your new pack with society is, you know, the net zero mining is, is an, important, an important procedure we need to go through, but it's achieving net zero within the society as a whole, right? And so... The metals that we produce are critical to that energy transition for society as a whole, like whether we're talking about windmills, whether we're talking about the distribution systems, whether we're talking about solar, what we produce as a mining industry is critical for the world to achieve energy transition in net zero. And I think we need to message that more outside of the mining industry. Miners get it. Miners know why mining metals and materials are important. We need to share that in a larger society to help actually get people to gain an understanding of how critical mining and the elements we produce are to this energy transition. So I just wanted to sort of step aside and for those on the call, take any opportunity you have to discuss that with people you interact with that aren't in the mining profession. And so Glenn, Glenn Watson, thank you very much. I'm gonna go now to, to Glenn Barr with Twin Metals and you know, Glenn, I'll turn it over to you. Um, again, so it's, you're not even in production, it's a project, so probably may not be some commitments, but you've got a little bit different because you're a wholly owned subsidiary of Antofagasta. And, and so maybe just walk us through that, including a little bit of what Twin Metals is for the audience that may not be familiar with it. Absolutely. Thanks, John. And I'm very glad to be here today and share what Twin Metals has planned for the future. As you said, Twin Metals is a wholly owned subsidiary of Antofagasta. And we were very pleased to see that last week, Antofagasta set a target of reducing its scope one and scope two GHG emissions by 30% by 2025 and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 or earlier. They've also pioneered the use of renewable energy at their operations in Chile, with one of their operations already supplied by 100% renewable energy, and all the remaining operations to be supplied by renewable energy by the end of next year. So they're already setting the bar high, and so as a, a wholly owned subsidiary, we have to commit to those same type of practices. As for Twin Metals, we've been working for the past 10 years to develop a modern mining project, and we are currently 18 months into the state and federal environmental review process. The proposed project design includes an underground mine with paste backfill, a processing plant, and a filtered tailings dry stack facility. The project will produce just over 45,000 tons of copper, 10,000 tons of nickel, and 100,000 ounces of gold and PGMs per year. As a project that is in the design and development phase, we have had the opportunity to track emerging technologies and expectations for the mining industry and have incorporated many of those into our project design. As a simple example, look at our design transition. We made away from conventional slurry tailings impoundment to a filter tailings dry stack facility. The application of this best available technology not only results in a much more sustainable means for storing tailings, but results in a project footprint decrease of almost 70%, a 
eliminates the need to look at transporting slurry tailings to uh, a significant distance to a suitable impoundment area and makes the entire project more resilient to climate change impacts because of the much smaller footprint and also the elimination of ponds and large water management features. As for greenhouse gases, TMM is currently completing our first life cycle assessment to quantify global warming potential for the project. This will include scope one, scope two, and upstream scope three emissions for the project. As we complete that, we intend to use this life cycle assessment as a means of identifying opportunities to further reduce greenhouse gases by focusing on the largest contributors within our current project design. The project's located in, in northern Minnesota. Northern Minnesota contains about a third of the U.S. copper reserves, almost 90% of the U.S. cobalt reserves, and 95% of the U.S. nickel reserves. These metals are essential to the development of the emerging green economy. Our commitment is to apply responsible mining to unlock these reserves to enable the entire economy to pursue net zero aspiration. And of course, that begins with us applying the same goals. Thanks, John. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate you know the output on on twin metals and what you're doing there. I think you know one of the things for me that uh, that really lands well is, is you all talk about some of the opportunities you see, not just in your commitments, but the opportunities to get there. And and as I look at that in net zero mining within Stantec, we've got an issue of same thing, and it's and it's got two main focuses on that. One is how to actually provide greener energy sources um, so that the energy we produce is more environmentally friendly. Uh, and the second phase is how to actually reduce that energy consumption in the operation. And so maybe I'll I'll start with the first one. And uh, Angie, I'll I'll go back to you on this. Is sort of you know what are you looking at Torex and what are some of the opportunities you see within in your organization just to short, sort of change the energy mix um, that you're using. Maybe if you just want to touch base on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, John. So again, maybe I'll, I'll just set a bit of context. So right now, our operations draw 100% of our electricity from the Mexican grid. And, and the grid in Mexico is a mix of um, about half natural gas, 28% hydro, and the rest a mix of coal and nuclear and geothermal. So there's definitely a lot of room for us to reduce our carbon footprint, especially in an area of the world where the sun shines pretty consistently. And so um, we were very pleased that last month we announced we'll be building an 8.5 megawatt solar plant. Um, this is our first real foray into renewable energy. And I think a tangible demonstration that we're serious when it comes to transitioning our energy mix uh, with a view to carbon neutrality over time. And so we're currently in the process of obtaining the required permits for the construction of the facility. Uh, we hope to get those over the summer and we'll begin uh, earthwork shortly thereafter. So in terms of impact, uh, the plant has the potential to reduce our scope two emissions by about 8.6% and our combined scope one and scope two emissions by about 4.75%. And that's based on our 2019 emissions profile. And you know, as is often the case with innovative um, and sustainable solutions, in addition to the environmental benefits, the solar plant is gonna provide a lot of economic upside and also um, uh, benefits to our local communities. So on the economic side, if you factor in the installed cost of the plant together with the ongoing lease fee, we expect to save about a million dollars per year in energy costs over the 20 year lease period with full payback of the plant at about year seven. Um, so certainly, you know, lots of opportunity there. And we also anticipate that the solar plant will create job opportunities for our, uh, in our local communities for daily operations and daily maintenance. And the installation of the facility also opens up the possibility of leaving that energy infrastructure behind to our host communities as part of our broader commitment to leave a, a net positive legacy where we operate. So, so lots of opportunity there. And moving forward, we also see significant potential to increase the capacity of the solar plant in the future, um, and including through solutions like battery power storage as an example. And so, um, you know, we're really looking to further increase uh, savings and further reduce emissions. And so we look forward or to more to come in the future there. I think um, I also just want to touch on the fact that the installation of the solar plant, I think, carries on a tradition of using innovation to mitigate environmental risk and to drive sustainable solutions at Torex. And I just quickly want to highlight two examples. So the first is um, a very innovative ore conveyor system. It's called the ROPECON. 
um, I'll do a little plug for our website. We just launched a new website uh, last week. And if you go onto our site, you can see a video of it. It's visually really, really impressive. Definitely the hallmark of our site um, if you come and visit. But it's an innovative 1.3 kilometer uh, automated conveyor system, which transports ore from our open pit to our processing plant over a 400 meter vertical drop. And you know, the primary reason that we employed Rocon in the first place was really around safety. Um, we wanted to reduce the safety risk of driving loaded trucks down very steep slopes. Um, but a major benefit is that Rocon actually produces almost 70% of the energy it consumes. Um, and so in so doing, you know, limiting stress on the grid and, and significantly reducing our carbon footprint. So that's one example. The other example I want to touch on is um, Torx's proprietary mining innovation, which we call the Makahai Mining System, which you may have heard of. It's been in test use in our Elimo underground mine um, since 2019. And just a brief description of what I mean by Makahai. So where a traditional underground mine uses haul trucks and, and scoops to carry ore to the surface, the Makahai system uses electric conveyors and an energy efficient two-way roof mounted monorail based transport system. And a full Makahai mine is expected to be all electric with mobile and fixed equipment powered by grid or battery power. And so you can imagine with no diesel trucks or other heavy equipment, um, CO2 emissions could be reduced quite substantially uh, using this technology. So we're in a test phase on this. Uh, we continue to test it at our LMO underground mine. And once we have a better understanding of the capability of the technology after this round of testing, we're gonna make a decision on whether or not to deploy it at Media Luna. So Media Luna is an underground mine that really represents our future in Guerrero. It's currently in the feasibility stage. Um, and you know, if we if we choose not to deploy it at Media Luna, we could look at options to potentially deploy it in the future on our broader Morelos property in Mexico. I'll just end there. Finally, on the two topic of Media Luna, um, as I said, we're, we're in feasibility stage. We plan to release our feasibility study in the first quarter of 2022. Um, and should we land on a conventional mine as opposed to a Makahai mine, we're certainly looking at options to transition our energy mix as part of that study with the addition of battery electric vehicles to form a bit of a hybrid fleet. And of course, our solar plant, which I spoke to, uh, will also play a very important role in providing Media Luna's future energy needs as well. So, so definitely a lot of things uh, on the go as we work to transition our energy mix and to demonstrate we're serious when it comes to eventually achieving carbon neutrality. You know, great action and a lot of great examples that you gave there of you know what you're putting in place, but also what you're testing and trying to pioneer for new technology. So both of them, the proven technology and the and the newer technologies are are great examples. So I thank you for your contributions there. I mean, I think one of the other things we need to do as an industry is is look outside to see what other opportunities there are, what are other um, comparable processes that aren't familiar with mining, but processes that can be used with mining, and how do we bring that knowledge in, into our industry? Um, I mean, the other thing that's very beneficial, and I'll turn it over to Glenn Watson now, maybe with Valet to discuss some of this, is collaboration. And, and so I mentioned previously before, if you went back several years, it was very much a competition and it's still a marketplace that we're in. So, you know, the companies are trying to get market share, but we're really trying to do that collaboratively because we know as an industry, we need to get different solutions and we need to change the perception of what mining does and we need to mine better. Um, and so with collaboration, I know, Valet, Rio Tinto, and BHP have just started to charge on to talk about electric vehicles, reaching outside of the mining industry to anybody that has a experience with it to see what they can do. Um, and so I know we'll hear lots more about that in the coming weeks as this has just kicked off. And Glenn, maybe you can touch us on some of the other things you're doing within Valet to help change the energy mix uh, within your operations. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, making sure everybody can hear me these uh, that that new challenge was uh, just recently um, um, made public is uh, that really does speak to the importance of of, um, of working together a multi-stakeholder approach to try to find solutions right and i'll touch on that a little bit but to be clear to the audience right now i'll be speaking to our efforts across our north atlantic operations and i mentioned earlier this includes facilities in canada in thompson manitoba in Ontario, in the Sudbury area where I am, and in Port Colborne in Southern Ontario, in Newfoundland and Labrador at our Voices Bay operation and in Long Harbor. And we, uh, the North Atlantic operations also includes facilities in Clitic, Wales, and in Japan at uh, Matsuzaka. 
But when you look at our emissions profile across these operations, the, the big players are the subway operations where we have several mines feeding a mill, smelter, refinery. And our Boise Bay operation, which is an open pit and a concentrator operation in, in Northern Labrador. And at this location, we're currently transitioning to an underground operation, which will triple our energy needs. And I'll speak more on that in a little bit. In Sudbury, our biggest uh, greenhouse gas contributors is from natural gas use. And we have the great benefit of a clean power, a clean source of power in Ontario, where it's produced primarily by hydroelectric facilities and nuclear. In fact, that's also the case in Manitoba, now in Newfoundland, uh, with the construction of the Muskrat Falls uh, generating station. So that alone positions the North Atlantic operations in an enviable position among our global operations. But we still need to achieve about a, approximately 325,000 ton reduction in carbon dioxide equivalents uh, by 2030 to meet our commitment. Back to natural gas use in, in, for a bit. In, in Sudbury, it's used to heat underground air, it's used for heat in the process in our mill, our smelter, our refinery buildings. Of course, we're in a cold climate. So it stands to reason that some of some of the more important important projects right now that are getting quick attention are just finding efficiencies in these processes. There is waste and there's room for improvement. So you know, first things first, right? We need we need to optimize our energy usage. And we're looking at things like waste heat recovery and use of biofuels and biomass to power our operations. Nothing at this stage in the game can really be off the table. So you see that it, it, it's more than just technology. It's, it's, it's also about changing behaviors on, on the shop floor to the top floor, so, so to speak, right? This is, and believe me, this is as much a, a challenge as developing the next big new technology that'll help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You need people to believe that their daily actions and decisions make a difference. I, I sometimes like to use the analogy of safety. We started off this discussion with a safety message as we often do across our entire industry. And our industry has involved, evolved in terms of safety over many years and, and that's, it's part of our culture. We can improve of course, but we, we, we go to work every day with safety in mind. This transition to low carbon is in many ways similar. We need a culture change in mining. And for a company like Ballet, it's transformational. But to be clear, like when you're talking carbon neutral in 2050, that means carbon neutral, right? So finding efficiencies and capturing the heat and using biomass is it's gonna help, but that's not carbon free. And that means looking at electrification and other renewables and other carbon free technologies, right? So basically changing our energy matrix, but it's not basic at all. I think, I, I think it's important at this point to point out that as an organization, we need to treat carbon credits as a last option. That's why you won't hear me talking much about credits. At this stage in our low carbon journey, I, I won't let myself consider that as part of our strategy. I want, I want to talk about uh, an exciting project of, at our Voice Bay operations, but I can't leave Sudbury without mentioning the, the decommissioning of the Superstack, our iconic Superstack, at the, at the Copper Cliff Smelter. Many of you are familiar with that structure. It's still standing and it, and it will be taken down, but a sizable contribution to greenhouse gas reduction was achieved by turning off the natural gas burners to the stack. And our recent AER project, which resulted in a a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the smelter. So we're pretty proud of that. And of course, the AER project had uh, resulted in a reduction in sulfur dioxide emissions, improved air quality. And again, that's uh, a great investment for the community here in Sudbury. We also have 30 uh, electric vehicles operating in our underground mines. And with, I think approximately 40 expected by the end of 2021. And that means we've eliminated 30 diesel powered units, which also reduces diesel exhaust and particulates and underground heat and noise, which you mentioned earlier, John, in your safety message. But apart from those obvious benefits, think, think of the message that sends to our workers. Think of, think of a career miner at 30 years of service operating a high tech 40 ton haul truck with barely any noise, zero emissions. It's game changing. So I mentioned our emissions profile across our North Atlantic operations and focused on our subway operations. And then let's, let's go east now across Canada and talk about our Voices Bay mine and mill. 
The Boise Bay is a, it's, it's an incredible deposit. It's, it's been an open pit operation since 2005, and we have a significant underground mine expansion underway. But here's the pinch. We currently burn up to 30 million liters of diesel a year to power that operation. Displacing diesel use here represents the single biggest opportunity for greenhouse gas reduction across our North Atlantic operations. So to do that, we're looking to construct a wind project and assess the possibility of a grid connection across Northern Labrador. Our wind project would allow us to displace nearly 20% of our diesel consumption and provide approximately 30% of our power needs. The possibility of grid connection is a very exciting opportunity for Valley, it, it, as it creates a, a win-win opportunity for the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, federal government, and importantly, the potential to benefit remote indigenous communities in Northern Labrador. We understand this, this is a big project. It's a multi-year project and one that will require multi-stakeholder and rights holders buy-in and participation. And it's, it's a project that leaves the company with the opportunity to leave a world-class positive legacy for these communities. With, you know, there's possibility of providing power and access to these currently diesel powered and remote communities. So I, I wanna emphasize the importance of what I just said about multiple parties being involved and being the beneficiaries of a project like this. I like to re remind my valet colleagues that our greenhouse gas uh, commitments are just that, they're commitments. They're not goals, they're not objectives. And it's the same for our governments. There's, there's an acknowledgement here that we can't do it alone. And I, I think what you'll see in the future, in the very near future, is a broad societal recognition that we will need to work together together to create solutions. Like industry and government scientists and educational institutions, indigenous communities, municipal governments, and on and on. We will need to work together to, to meet these very aggressive commitments. And it's frankly an exciting and challenging time for our industry. Thanks, Glenn, and appreciate the insight on that. I mean, especially your closing about having to work together, everything we need to do to, to look at what we all do as a group to move that. And I'll just add on to your point about changing behaviors, right? Because it's not just changing behaviors on the shop floor, like you said, but in management executives, in the engineering and designs, but then in society as a whole of, you know, what does actually net zero mean? How do we get there as a society? And so, um, you know, I'll go take it back to the operational level. And we talk about changing behaviors. Um, Glenn, why, Glenn Barr, is there anything you wanted to add uh, before I get into sort of our next question on the energy remix as far as energy sources? Yeah, thanks, John. Just just really quickly, I mean, we've we've got the opportunity to work in a well-developed grid situation here uh, in northern Minnesota and working with the local power providers. They all have their own commitments for renewable energy. Um, and the state of Minnesota is very aggressive at setting um, alternative energy uh, mixes uh, and looking at transitioning to different energy mixes for the entire grid. So definitely, you know, one of the advantages of working here is um, being able to plug right into the grid and not have to look at powering our project by some form of diesel or, or other alternative energy source. Good, thanks. And Glenn, you might as well leave it on. I'm going to jump it over to you uh, very, very quickly right away with the next question. Um, and I'm sort of going to tie into what uh, what Glenn Watson had said about changing behaviors on the shop floor, or on the on the mine floor of what they need to do. You're in the fortunate situation where it's not around changing behaviors in operation because it's a whole new site. You're developing it. And so what are some of the things you can do with reducing the energy demands through what you're designing or how you get how you actually reduce consumption, not just on the on the energy mix side of it, and how do you do that in a project stage? Could you share a little bit of that with the audience? Yeah, absolutely, John. One of the exciting opportunities of being at a phase of a project like ours is to constantly be looking for ways to improve the design of our project. And so we routinely look at each of the steps in the process and evaluate that as part of our climate change strategy. As an example, if we looked at our mining step, um, being an underground mine, there's a lot of movement of ore that has to occur underground, and our mine will rely almost exclusively on conveyors for the majority of ore movement. Um, we've gone and looked at, you know, mobile equipment versus conveyors, and we really see that using those conveyors substantially reduces the requirement for that underground mobile equipment and allows us to 
rely on um, grid power for or movement and for you know, but there are still aspects of the underground mine that will require um, mobile equipment and for that we're looking at uh, ways to optimize and hopefully reduce the size of the fleet and for that fleet we're looking at alternate lower carbon fuel sources to power that equipment um, as these design improvements are integrated into the project, mine ventilation, and we heard the we heard Glenn talk about that at the existing operations, we are looking at our mine ventilation requirements. And as we change that um, underground fleet, optimize it, reduce it, rely on conveyors or other um, or movement technologies, we'll evaluate the mine ventilation requirements. And with the objective being to decrease the power requirements necessary for ventilation, and with that also looking at decreasing the air heating requirements for ventilation and being in northern Minnesota the winter months are cold and right now it's planned that propane combustion is what is heating the um, the mine air during those winter months and so if we're able to decrease the ventilation requirements we'll also be looking at decreasing the need for propane usage for that. Um, looking at another component of our project, as part of the rock and tailings management strategy, approximately 45% of the tailings will be placed back in the mine as paste backfill. Our proposed mining method will not bring waste rock to surface either. So combined, these decisions have eliminated a substantial surface impact, which in turn has eliminated the consumption required to construct and operate the facilities required to manage that material. And when you think about that, that's right from land clearing, construction of uh, liners necessary under these materials, reclamation energy, and then also potentially water treatment um, costs, as well as power consumption for that water treatment. So really when you look at from a footprint, reducing our footprint has also allowed us to reduce our consumption because of all of the inherent um, cost of those um, those aspects of the project, you know, and by eliminating land clearing our, and by reducing our footprint, you know, in an area that is substantially um, covered by wetlands. So certainly connecting that to climate change and, and the benefit that wetlands play, um, looking at keeping our footprint minimized and eliminating the need to clear more land than absolutely necessary is, is certainly one of the advantages that we're looking at for our project. Um, now, the other component of our tailings management is, is um, the filter tailings process. Now, that can be quite an energy intensive step, running those filter presses to produce a low moisture filter cake that will then be dry stacked, um, is, uh, does consume quite a bit of energy. And so we're currently working with various suppliers to inv investigate technologies that could decrease the power consumption of this step by 50% and possibly even up to 90%, which certainly would be a real great improvement to um, to reduce our consumption. And then looking at the filter tailings, they have to be transported from the filter plant to the dry stack facility itself. And we are evaluating a combination of conveyors and alternate fuel mobile equipment as a means of reducing our impact. We've also looked at just workforce location and transportation as a way to reduce our project's impact. And we have decide, decided to locate 10% of our workforce at an administration center that's located in one of the local communities rather than locating that at the project site. We've also committed to bus transportation of the workforce to the project site. Both of these decisions have reduced the impact that single occupancy vehicles would create, both in terms of the fuel consumption for those vehicles, but just as importantly, again, reducing the site uh, footprint by not requiring all of those parking spaces for those vehicles. And John, these are just a few of the ideas that we have and continue to consider as part of the project design. The challenge isn't really what can we do, it's how do we stay on top of technologies, evaluate those technologies and incorporate them into the project design. Most importantly, while staying on track to put this project into operations. And that's a challenge that we at Twin Metals are really willing to undertake and successfully answer. Now, thanks, Lynn. I mean, it's a good point. Technology is changing so quickly. You know, Ballet or Torex can implement it because they have operations already on the go. But as you look to build it, the technology three years, four years down the road, could be different and how do you actually apply that and, and how do you prepare to apply that as you go across I think is is really valuable you know the other thing for me just hearing you talk about some of these examples is when you make one change like you know going to dry stack tails 
how that actually has a domino effect of more improvements. Now it's a smaller footprint, so now you can put it closer. So the transportation cost goes down, and so many of these are interact interrelated. It gets me back to you know, 20 years ago when I was younger or newer into the operations. The move was to mass production, right? How do we get bigger trucks, bigger fleets, larger equipment? Um, and in doing that, larger drift sizes, more waste rock, all the things that went away, all right, went together with it. Now there's a little bit of consideration of the reverse of that. Maybe do we go with smaller? Angie talked before about Torex. You know, there was just another one by Rockcliffe in a discussion about going to, to smaller twin declines instead of one large one. The rock consumption of the two twins is less. You have better ventilation flow through in the system as you're driving it. So, so lots of benefits that can come through these examples of, of energy reductions in consumption. Um, maybe Glenn, Glenn Watson, I'll turn it back to you. If there's anything you wanted to add as far as the consumption side, um, and just a quick brief, if there's anything you wanted to add on this one. Yeah, the, the uh, on the consumption side, really, to to uh, like like most things, we have a growth mindset, right? But more than ever, we need to optimize and reduce. And the renewable generation energy storage is certainly vital for the future. We simply cannot continue to consume more and more in perpetuity. We need to get back to basics on, on, on that one and understand the fundamentals of, of what we need and where there's waste. And there's certainly waste uh, and room for improvement, which is often more economic in terms of a business case, but also good for the planet. We need, we need to be very intentional in our consumption. And we have a program here in, in, in the Sarbury's Energy Efficiency Program. It consists of a, it's a multidisciplinary team that works together to develop ideas and bring them to fruition and share best, best practices among a very broad net of operations across our global operations. So that is in a way an advantage to us to be able to take advantage of, it for, of uh, that expertise that lies elsewhere. But really awareness and transparency, and transparency in the cost management really has been a big success piece and with respect to getting that buy-in from our, from our operators. And when we work with operations to see projects through that get reflected in the product costs, it's meaningful. And we, we, we need to keep showing that it makes a difference and that it matters. Okay, thanks, Glenn. A Angie, I know when you answered the previous question, you talked about Maka High and the RopeCon, which were both methods for energy uh, reduction or consumption reduction. Is there anything else you wanted to add on this, uh, on this topic? Yeah, I think, John, it's just, you know, forums like these are so great because you get to meet, you know, peers in the industry that are doing really innovative things. And I, I see a lot of similarities between um, um, Blend's company and, and Torex. We also have a dry stack filter tailing storage facility. Um, we reduce the moisture contact to about 17%, which conserves water and, and eliminates the needs from banquets. But would love to uh, keep in touch with Glenn on, on what they're doing to uh, reduce the energy required, because as he said, it's a very intensive uh, process. So, um, and I think, you know, with our monorail technology, we're also interested in different conveyor systems that he, uh, he spoke to. So it's just great to see kind of the industry coming together and, and looking at all these kind of out of the box, different options. I think, um, in terms of reducing consumption, I'll just add that I think, you know, as we move forward with our climate change strategy, there'll definitely be a greater focus on efficiency as part of the equation. And, you know, in order to do that, we really need to be engaging with our employees on the front lines. And I think Glenn Watson spoke to that as well. They're closest to the operations. They know the operations best and they can see the opportunities to reduce consumption and waste. And so I think for us at Torex, as we you know, work to ensure proper governance and oversight at the executive and board level, we're also going to be working on engaging our employees and our broader communities to be part of the solution. Um, and that'll be a greater focus for us going forward. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Angie. And, and like you said, part of these whole webinars in the CIM series that they're putting on is to create those interactions and the connections, not just for the panelists, but for the audience as well. And so for those on the call at the end, you'll see the email addresses of, of the panelists if you have more information, but it's creating that network. And I think there's going to be lots of questions. I see them on the screen already. So I'll, I'll ask the panelists to, just to put on their cameras and we'll do a, a quick roundtable on the questions. Unfortunately, we may not be able to answer them all just due to time, but I'll start off with more a fundamental one for, for the entire panel. And it, it really says, you know, is net zero realistic? And, and if so, by when? And, and unfortunately, we won't answer the by when because that'll get into a lot of debate. But, you know, is net zero realistic? And maybe your thoughts on why or why it isn't. 
And and Angie, maybe uh, if you don't mind, I'll turn it back to you uh, to start. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to believe it is realistic. And, you know, we're seeing the technology that's that's coming to enable that to happen, technology that we would never have thought possible, you know, 20, even 10 years ago. And so, yeah, I do believe it's possible. And I think my view is as an industry, we have to believe it's possible. And we have to work together to move forward together. Like not any one of us is going to have the, the magic bullet. It's going to require forums like this. It's going to require sharing. It's going to require learning. It's a daunting goal and it's coming quickly but I do believe it's possible and I do believe as an industry we'll get there and we'll continue to demonstrate that we um, first of all are enabling it to happen through the through the materials that we're producing and that we are part of the solution. Great thanks. Glenn Watson. Yeah it's hard to say that any better than Angie just did like we can't I can't let myself think that it's not possible like we can't as an organization think that it's not possible we we really have no idea what's coming at us in five or 10 years, right? Both from a, a political climate to a society's expectations, and especially from a technology point of view. We, you know, there, there it's not that long ago that we uh, couldn't dream of some of the technologies that are being spoken of right now. So, yeah, I do think it's possible. It's a short time frame. It's going to be a huge challenge, but we need, we, again, we just, we simply can't let ourselves think any other way. We need to plan that way work together to find the solutions and that's i'm going to re-emphasize that as many times as i can like we de we just simply have to take a multi-stakeholder approach to this to developing the technologies that are needed to, to get there all right thanks glenn Barr, anything to add uh 100 support what's being said if i i think setting these goals i, I would ask why wouldn't it be achievable i i think we've we've tackled the challenges like our the safety Health and safety has been tackled very similar. Uh, I, you know, calling out a technology, dry stacking people, you know, filter tails. People thought 10 years ago, sure, super small tonnage is great, but you know, now you see projects that are considering hundreds of thousands of tons a day and and entertaining that. And I think our industry is spectacular at stepping up to the plate when given a challenge. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And like I said, I think the debate is. You know, we're so close to getting there. Will we not, with the tech, current technology we have, it's debate. You know, debatable that we think we can or can't put in another five years of technology, another ten years of advancement. You know, I guarantee that's what's going to get us there. So I also think it's a realistic goal. Um, maybe one more, just on clarity. And Glenn Watson, I'll turn it over to you. Um, the question is, does 100% renewable equal net zero or zero carbon? And 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 what's your thoughts on that? Your your perspective. Does 100% renewable equal net zero? Or zero carbon? Or yeah, zero carbon. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, right? Because you, you have all these ancillary operations across the, you know, at a, at a particular site. And, um, and, and you know, there, there are so many rabbit holes you need to go down to make sure that all of the supporting infrastructure at a particular site does, in fact, uh, achieve a, a, a carbon-free uh, atmosphere as well. So important question. And, and you know, if I use the Boise Bay, for example, the, the example that we, uh, that I just spoke about, uh, we were, were very keen to look at technologies that will allow us to displace diesel use there. But there's, one of the issues there is the mobile fleet, right? We can't, you're not gonna have, um, you're not gonna plug in your scoop uh, to to a power source there so and and the and one of the challenges at that site being such being so northern is the cold weather so do, do battery operated uh, uh, machines make sense there probably not or maybe they do not now maybe maybe later so yeah very good question uh, this this is all part of the of the mix of of research and and development and complex things we have to try to figure out but um, excellent question. Yeah, and I mean, I think the other one for me, because we have this discussion sometimes when we're talking about implementing battery equipment underground, but if the grid feeding it isn't, you know, isn't green, isn't renewables, are you actually solving the problem? And the answer I put in is, well, you know, if you put diesel, guaranteed you're not solving the problem and guaranteed you're going to put diesel, you know, you're going to burn carbon fuel. If you put electric, at least there's the opportunity if something changes in the distribution that you're going to get to a renewable source. So. You know, to your point, let's not focus on on what it is upstream. We want to take care of that, but not not say, well, we'll just put diesel underground because what's feeding it is diesel anyways, because that could change at any point in time. 
we've got some specific questions to each of the operations. And so, Glenn Barr, maybe I'll go to you next. And one of the questions was um, just around the electric fleet. Are you considering that at Twin Metals? And, and what does that look like? Or what's what's in your thought process? Yeah, and I, I think as I've alluded to, I, right now we're looking at all technologies. We're looking at the maturity of the technologies, the capability of of the mining industry in Minnesota to support those technologies. So absolutely, it's one of the things that we're looking at for um, for this project as we move the design forward. Great. Angie, I had another question for you. Um, when it talked about sort of the steps you were taking on your journey and, you, you know, Nothing yet, but it mentioned, I think you mentioned that you had a target for the end of the year to make those commitments. Um, what does that look like and are you still on track is one of the questions from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. We're committed to putting out our first climate report by the end of the year and the intent is to put our you know, short and longer term commitments in there. So as you can imagine, a lot of conversation happening at the executive and the board level, um, but we do expect to be on track with that. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Another question, it's directed to Glenn, but I'll, I'll let Glenn Barr take the first answer and then move it over to the other two, because I think it's applicable um, in operations as well. But it says for developing projects, if you look to achieve net zero in that, doesn't that really mean increasing your cost and the cost related with the project? And, and how do you balance that? Um, it could, you know, I think taking a full life cycle look at the project, uh, and constantly looking at it. So whether it's at a pre-fees or trade-off studies feasibility, looking at it. Um, I, I don't know if you, if, if you look at the longer term implications of some of these decisions, if you look at potential carbon pricing in the future, if you look at all these other things, I, I don't know if it necessarily translates to an overall impact to project economics. It might be just an, a, a trade-off between uh, higher capital um, and lower operating or easier reclamation uh, and closure considerations. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's not just on carbon, you know, neutrality. It's on all the decisions that we're having to make. Uh, you know, dry stacking and waste rock management, water treatment. Those are all things that we have to constantly weigh against each other. But certainly, I don't think it's cut or it's cut and dry in those considerations that just increasing your front end cost is not going to be offset by um, savings in the future or, or higher acceptability. You know, that projects are very difficult to permit. And I think we have to, we also have to apply some level of credit to a higher um, acceptability of a project okay, in great. the decision that we take. Great, thanks. Angie, may I turn it over to you because you're on the border of a developing project and an operation. Any, any thoughts on that, uh, on the cost associated? Yeah, I agree. I sorry, I agree completely with what Glenn said. And I mean, we saw, saw with our solar plant, right? That we've got the environmental benefit, but it's actually going to save us twenty million dollars over twenty years, which is, which is not insubstantial. And and I do think too, as society becomes less tolerant and we see, you know, higher prices on carbon, then you know, I think we we there is the opportunity for sure um, to to realize savings. I think too, you know, companies have to be. Um, cognizant that you know there are going to be some upfront costs, but I think in terms of the long term, um, we definitely have to look over the longer term as as opposed yeah. to just the, the short term upfront costs. No, perfect. And you know I think that's one of the things. We, it was the same thing with safety, right? Safety always came with a cost, was the perception. But no, there's things we can do. There's way we can design things that actually have cost benefits, not just an increased cost. But what does it mean for a large company that's already got operations on the go and so much sunk cost? Glenn Watson. What's your thoughts on this? John, I think a lot depends on the location of, 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 uh, of the new operation, right? So if, you, if you're in proximity to clean energy sources, such as might would be the case, for example, uh, for Glenn Byers operation or here in Sudbury, for instance, we have the advantage, as I mentioned before, uh, to be hooked up to a clean uh, power grid, right? Um, and I, you might immediately at the, at the, at this point in the game, you, you, your costs might go up with the remoteness of the operation, where you have to start considering technologies like wind and solar. But at the same time, as 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 time marches on and technologies improve, the costs of those those uh, alternative power sources will will go down, right? So, 
you know, it, it, the balance of many, many things. And as, as Glenn Barr suggested too, right, you need, you know, closure costs would necessarily have to go up with the remoteness of the mine and, 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 and so on and so forth. So very Perfect, dependent, I think it depends on location. Yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but the other thing important cost is schedule. And to keep on schedule, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to close out as we're running out the hour. Nicely done, John. Very nicely done. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, John, Angie, Glenn, and Glenn. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. A uh, link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, it'll also include a short survey. Uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, great panel. Thank you all. Um, we hope to see you at our next CIM Magazine Solutions Webinar. Uh, solutions Exchange webinar, and you can find the listing of the latest CIM virtual events on our calendar of events at CIM.org. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, everyone.